Okay, you should be getting some sound. Or at least I think you should be getting some sound. Okay, so here we are. We're ready to go with the first replacement lecture for MIS 3371. It's Sunday, March 22nd. Uh, this thing you're looking at on the screen now is sort of, you know, what I want to get by, what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks. And basically, I'm going to try to do this on video. Uh, you don't, you'll notice you're not looking in my face. Uh, I don't really care about the video part. I really care about the audio and the documents. So we're going to try to do this with a lot of documents in my voiceover. Uh, Y'all don't really need to look at me in class, so this is, shouldn't be too much of a change. You'll at least hear my voice, and you'll at least be able to see what I'm doing on the screen. Okay, so first, first thing about the final exam. Uh, final exam will be at the regularly scheduled time uh, in April 27th. I'll email you the exam. You'll have a couple hours. You'll email it back to me. Uh, this The number of classes we have is going to sort of depend on how much I get done here, but I want to get two topics out of the way. Uh, the, the two topics are XML and CSS. These are going to be your two primary question contents for the final exam. Um, we're going to start off with XML today, and then we'll do a couple of XML sessions, and we'll do a couple of CSS sections, and then we'll do some other stuff. So for right now, you can go onto the syllabus and you can find 20 copies of the final exam down at the bottom under April 27th. You might want to start looking at those. You'll notice in all of those 20 cases, there are two questions. One's an XML question, one's a CSS question. So this is going to significantly narrow what you need to study. There's two topics. you got 20 examples of how to write the code. It should be a piece of cake on the final. Remember the final... Final counts 45%, uh, 40% on midterm, three five-point homework questions. Um, I still haven't figured out how I'm you know, going to get you your exam one grades, but they're coming pretty soon. I'll probably have that in the next couple of days. Okay, so we're going to start with XML. All right, let's see what we can do with that. All right, first thing we're going to do is we're going to bring up the syllabus. 4371, that's what I'm going to be talking from most of the time. You're all pretty familiar with the syllabus. So we're going to go down here to where we should have been had we not ha stopped this, and you'll see that what, what we have here is we're at about <clears throat> right after spring break. We missed this week right here, so we're sort of here today. Well, actually, we're here on Sunday the 22nd. So we're going to look at these three days. This is the content material for XML. So these three pieces of content, and they're divided up into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten different web pages which have the material on it. And then we're going to do some other stuff. We're going to talk about assignment number two, and we'll get to that later. Then when we get down here on the syllabus to CSS, here's the content information on the second question. This is the this is cascading style sheets. So we'll get to that. But first we're going to do the XML question. And we're going to start with this part right here. So I'm not I'm not doing anything unusual about this. I'm just I'm just talking what I would normally do in class. Alright, so what I'll do with this lecture when I get done with it is I'll put it over here. I'll put all the lectures over here just like I put all the ex other external reference material over here. And we'll just walk down the syllabus and talk about it. Okay, so the first first thing we probably want to think about here, uh, we can look at XML. Okay, this is this is a data structure. This this is this is this is not a programming language. It's an, it's a markup language. It's markup language in the same sense that HTML is a markup language. It's not a programming language. It, it's basically what we refer to as tags. We, we've been down this road for weeks and weeks now. You understand how tags work. Uh, XML is a markup language just like HTML. It's sort of like HTML. Okay, so the difference is HTML is called an application. In other words, it's a specific set of tags that do specific things when processed by the browser. That, that's not our intent here. Our, our intent here is to encapsulate some data in, in a file in some way. We can send it around to people and let them extract that data 
send the data, modify it, send it somewhere else. XML is a, is a data structure technique. And there are things called XML files, and we're going to look at a lot of XML files. Okay, so the first thing we want to get over with is we're going to start today on the DTD. On your syllabus, this is on March 16th, this is the DTD. <clears throat> All right, so a couple of nomenclature things. In, in the discussion of XML, when we say elements, what we really mean are tags. Now, I'm not really sure why they changed it that way, but that's the way it is. In, in our nomenclature of talking about XML, we're going to talk about XML elements, but in effect, you can substitute the word tags, and that'll be okay. Okay, so one of the good things about XML is only, there are only two kinds of tags. The, the first kind of tag is a tag that contains data, and the second kind of tag is a tag that contains more tags. All right, so let's look at how this all this data structure gets laid out here. So I'm going to increase the font size here. That's, that's probably good enough. So we're going to start off with this line right here. This is how you open and, and close the, the an XML file. All the XML start, start off the same way. It's a question mark XML version one question mark tag. This, this is one of the strange things about XML. We're just talking about opening and closing tags everywhere, but the XML file only has an opening tag. It doesn't have a closing tag. Okay, so you just, you just have to sort of go with this. This, 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 this tag never changes. It is always the first tag in an XML file. Okay, and then we're going to define the document type. That's an exclamation point doc type. Name of the doc type. Uh, you, you sort of know this one. So if we have an HTML document, we know that the outside set of tags in HTML is our HTML tags. There's an opening HTML tag. That's the first thing in the file. And the last thing in the file is the ending HTML file. Okay, so whatever this tag, whatever you put right here, this is the name of the outside tag. It's the document type. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have elements inside the outside tags. Okay, so whatever you choose as the name of the document type, and you're going to make up all of these tag names for yourself. First, this is the first tag, whatever name you make up. And the document will end with a slash name of the document type. You, you can see how that, that, that works out in HTML. Okay. Works just like a body tag or an HTML tag. All right. First rule about this in XML is the tag, the tag names themselves are case sensitive. The FRED tag in capital letters is different from the FRED tag in lowercase. All right, so now what we're going to do is for every element, in other words, for every tag, we're going to say it's of one of two kinds of things. It's going to be tags that contain data or tags that contain more tags. All right. And then we're going to have a list of all of them in the file. And that makes up what's called a data type definition. Now, there are a couple of additional constraints about not only do we have to make up a name for the tag, element, and the list, the list of tags that can be inside that element, or it's data. It's going to be one of these two things. Can't be anything else. Okay, so in this list of elements, in other words, a tag that what it has underneath it is more tags, we're going to have to talk about each one of the elements. So we're going to make a list. Of, of more tags right here. This would be a list of tags. And then we're going to say something about the tags. And here there are six things we can say about each one of the tags. First one is if we separate the list with commas, that means that the tags have to appear in the specific order that they are encountered. If we follow an element with a question mark, that makes it optional. If we say plus, I can have more than one, one or more. Star means zero or more. Vertical pipe means pick between a group of things. And 
open and close parentheses are, are grouping characters. Okay, so let's do one that, and this is sort of good. We're going to sort of stick on this one because this sort of has an important kind of example, and probably everybody sort of understands this. We'll make up a little example here of purchase order. Now, you know, you know, you do this all the time. If you bought anything from a catalog over the web, now this is this is what we a real simple version of what kind of data you might have to have if we're going to put this data into XML. Well, first thing we're going to have is we're going to have to have your name. That that sounds like a reasonable thing when you're buying something, and probably an address and uh, what city you live in, state, and zip code, and then what it is that you purchased. And the way we're going to look at a simple version, we've got a product code and how many of them you bought and what was the price you paid for each one of them. Now the difference between these two categories is these are called singletons, these first five. They're, they're data. They, they, don't, they don't have tags underneath them. They have values between the tags. So I'll have a, a, an opening buyer name tag, somebody's name, closing buyer day, opening it, like that. These are, these are singletons. Well, with the exception of address, you, have, you might actually have more than one address line. For example, you might live in an apartment, you might have a street address, and then on the next line you might have an apartment number. So brand name, city, state, zip, look like singletons. Address, you know, maybe is multiple tags. And then, this is the big one, the order line. For every time you place an order, that's going to be one line, product code, quantity, and price. You can have as many as you want of those, but you probably at least ought to have one. All right, so let's let we look at that information, how what we will get out of that. For, so from, for this organization, what we have is the DTD starts like this. Here's that XML tag. Here's the doc type. We're going to call this purchase order. This is our outside set of tags. And then there's a square bracket, square bracket right here. And this is going to be the end of everything down here is this square bracket. Okay, so doc type is purchase order. So the element, the tag, purchase order, has tags underneath it. And one of the tags will be buyer name. There's our buyer name right here. And we're going to make address uh, have um, one or more. So let's go back up and look at that. So it's a plus. So one or more address lines, one city, one state, one zip code, one or more order lines, like that. So I got maybe, and this, this thing won't be more, address won't be more than two. Well, I guess it could be three, but likely we, we put it in there as a two, and then city, state, zip, or one, buyer name is one. Order lines depends on how many lines you order. Now you'll notice this, this creates a really interesting structure here. Uh, if, you were, if you were trying to do this, if you were trying to take Excel and lay out a row in Excel to encapsulate this data, so you'd have a column called buyer name and maybe we'd have two columns for address, a column for city, a column for state, a column for zip code. But when you got out here to order line, each, each order line is going to have three columns, product code, quantity, and price, and then perhaps a second product, product code, quantity, and price. And well, did, how, So well, what happens here is we, we don't know how many of these we might have. We could have a million order lines all going to the same buyer, same, same address, same city, same state, same zip. We'd have a lot of these. We just don't know. Okay, but that's the DTD. That lays out this element purchase order. Okay, so what we call, this is called the root, the outside set of tags. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the parts of purchase order and ask, what, what do we know about these tags? Okay, well, most of these tags, with the exception of address and order in line, these are data. This is we, we're going to put data in these tags. So let's look at what that what that means. That's that's normally going to be PC data. That's parsed character data. Now, all, it, what what that means is it's any ASCII character except 
greater than, less than, and the and sign. Okay, so your data that put between the tags cannot have one of these, or one of these, or one of these for obvious reasons, because they might be interpreted as tags. Um, or you've got C data, which is unparsed character data where we can put less than, greater than, and the end sign. Okay, so it's only, you only got two choices here. You got parsed character data, <clears throat> or character data. Parsed character data has no less than, no greater than, no ends. Character data doesn't care. All right, so let's fill in the rest of it. So here's my XML file. Doc type is purchase order. That's my outside set of tags. The purchase order has buyer name, one or more address, city, state, zip, one or more order lines, buyer name, data. Okay, so this so buyer name is not going to have any tags underneath it, just data. Address, one or more address lines. One, one city pair, one state tag, one zip, set of zip tags, and then we get to the order line. And in the order line, we have multiple order lines. We don't know how many. And for each order line, we've got three tags. Product, quantity, and price, all of which are data. In the square bracket. Okay, so there's my matching square bracket right there. Okay, so this gives me the document type. My outside set of tags for the purchase order. The purchase order is one buyer name, one or more address lines, one city, one state, one zip code, and I don't know how many order lines. Data, 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 data. Order lines have product, quantity, and price. Product, quantity, and price are data items. Okay, let's see how it looks now. All right, now let's go in and let's put some data. So here's my DTD, here's my XML, here's my doc type and my square bracket. Outside set of tags, what are the tags inside? Define all the tags inside, square bracket. That ends the data type definition. Now notice I have an open left parentheses right here and I have a right parentheses right here. And here's purchase order. Okay, purchase order is my outside set of tags. I can come down and look at the end of this. This is the end of the file down here. So here's my purchase order here. Ending purchase order tag here. Purchase order has one buyer name, one address. No, excuse me, two addresses. City, state, zip code, order line. One product, one quantity, one price in the order line. Order line, product, quantity, price, in the order line, in the purchase order. Okay, so that, that's how that lays out. So notice what I've got inside this XML file is I've got the data type definition which tells me the names of all the tags, what's the relationship between one another, and, and what are the constraints about the data. Right, so it's clearly got two parts. It's got the doc type, this is the DTD, and then it's got the XML data. Okay, that, that looks pretty simple on the face of it. Who the hell would ever want to do this? Okay, so the, the, the interesting thing about this, this structure of data in XML is, it is it's a tree. It, it's not a table like Excel with rows and columns, it's a tree. And we'll start looking at it as a tree when we get over to the JavaScript. But for right now, we'll just, we'll just stick to this. All right, so we have a purchase order here. This is, uh, this is one order, this is my order, right? And I bought two wool sweaters and a pair of gloves. Right? And, and this is, here's my address. All right, so let's see what would happen if I was the company and somebody sent me a bunch of purchase orders. Okay, what could I do with those? Well, what I could do with those is I could make a big stack of purchase orders. All right, so watch what I'm doing here. Stack of purchase orders. If I looked at that as my outside set of tags, 
It's just a whole bunch of purchase orders defined exactly like I defined them before. So now instead of having one purchase order, which is this one right here, I have a whole stack of purchase orders. And I have a, a, a tag that says stack of purchase orders, the opening version and ending version of stack of purchase orders. Okay. Now let's go down and look at attributes. Okay, this, this is really a pain in the ass, but this uh, you, you, you've seen this already. Uh, tags in HTML, Man, many of the tags in HTML have more information inside the tag than in any other place. And you see, we've seen, we've seen this several times. We saw this in um, like a table tag. And we've got rows equals something and columns tables and rows. It's not, not that at all. But anyway, so let's go look at that for a second. Let me stop this. No. Okay, so I made a mistake there. No, no. Unfortunate mistake. I said the wrong thing. So, all right, let's go do this again. So, so we what we're talking about is is attributes, and we have we have things like we've seen attributes like BG color. We've seen rows. We've seen columns. We've seen lots of different attributes that are inside of tags that are, are reasonably common. And what we're going to discover when we get through this is that we're going to have to address the question of all of those tags, those attribute tags. That is the whole discussion of cascading style sheets, which is the second half of the exam. But for the moment, we just need to be aware of that we can have, we can have attributes and they can have values. Uh, we can say something like, let's suppose we have a product and what we want to do is we want to have a buyer size and we want that value to be small, medium, large, or extra large and make it required. So when we looked at this product buyer tag here, like this, we were to come over and try to write that tag, it, 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 would, it, would, it would be easy. It would be product, would be the tag, and then the attribute would be buyer size, and then it would have a value like that. So this it's just a way to specify what the optional values are for any of any of the attribute tags. Okay, and then if you want to know if it's all working, you can always send it over and have it checked. You just copy your, save it in a file or drop it in here, and these guys will check and see if it's all working. Now, it may or may not be. Okay, so that's the general idea. What we get here is we're going to use XML to store data. And we're going to be able to store a lot of data. And it is entirely up to us what the tag names are and what the rules for the data are. Now, this is, this is extensively used on the Internet in the background. You don't see this a lot. But we're going to discover that it's actually quite useful. All right. All right, so let's go back to the syllabus. Back up here after the DTD. And this is... Let's talk about what we can do with it. What we can do with uh, XML if we're in the browser. Well, the first thing we can do in the browser, if we have a file of XML, all we have to do is load it in the browser, and the browser is going to parse that XML. Now, this, this, is, this is the browser's version of the data. So we can see here, this is, here's the doc type. The doc type is a journal voucher. And, Here's my outside tag, journal voucher, and here's, my ins here's this matching component. I've got what appears to be a fiscal month ta tag, source reference number tag, journal entry tag. These are four account numbers, major, minor, sub one, sub two, these are account numbers. Transaction amount, description. So these are journal entries, account number, transaction amount, description. Two journal entries, and I don't hate to bring up accounting here, but notice my, my journal entries do match. They both the debits and the credits add up to zero. And then I've got an in the journal voucher. 
So if you, when you had when you had the accounting class, you probably see this coming, right? There's one fiscal month on the voucher. There's one source reference number, and there may be a whole page or page after page after page of journal entries, all having to add up to zero when we get done. Okay, so one thing it's easy to look at in the browser. We just load it up, and the, the browser will take the XML file. And notice this is this file type up here is XML. So you get it into your browser. Load the file up. Any browser will do this. We can, we can do this same sort of thing with, we go over and we fire up Chrome. Do the same thing in Chrome. Get the same general idea. Not, not particularly better in one way or the other. It's it's the same thing. We get exact. We should get exactly the same thing, no matter which browser processes the data. Okay, so that's that's one thing to do is to look at the data in the browser. But more realistically, we probably want to take that XML data, and we probably want to put it on the HTML page in some more interesting format than you know this. There's nothing wrong with that format, but you know I think I could do a better job laying it out on the page. All right, so let's let's look at what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to use the document object model, and we're going to roll this out into a container. Okay, so let's let's look at a simple a simple case. So what I've got here's here's my XML file. This is this is about as simple as it gets. And notice what I've done is I've left the DTD out. Okay, so I hate to tell you this, but you can leave the DTD out, but and if if, the, if it parses correctly, and that's pretty simple. Notice this parses correctly. Like, there's an outside family tag, there's a dad and a mom and a son tag. Looks like reasonably well formed HTML, and if it's well formed, the browser it doesn't matter whether you have the DTD or not. The tag structure will allow the browser to read the data. Okay, so what we're going to do is we have here, this is this is our XML data. We got to have a way to get that data onto a web page. And how we're going to do that is we're going to hide the data in an XML tag. Now this this is this is from old back in IE five. It tells you how far this goes back. This is back twenty five years ago when they were doing this. Okay, so the XML tag is an IE specific thing. Right, I'm going to hide it. I'm going to put this in. This is called this is a container. Right? I'm just giving it an ID. It's called a data island because it's a data. It's an island of data right in the middle of your HTML page. All right. So let's look at my script here. So here, so you'll recognize. Here, here's my H HTML. It's pretty simple. It looks like a table of some sort. Right. And here's here is. My data. Here's my little data island down here. Notice I called it data island. This is just an island of data. When the browser hits this, it's going to go, okay, script. I don't know what to do with that because it's script, it's not HTML. So, browser ignores all of this. However, my JavaScript, here's my JavaScript. When the page is loaded, I run up here and I do this thing called onload. Okay, so what we're going to do is with the JavaScript to go get that data out of the island. So here's my HTML page. Here's the data island right here. I'm going to suck this data up into my JavaScript. Okay, so how I'm going to do this? I'm going to go do go do this. This is this is pretty understand. Document get element by ID. Find something called data island. Here's data island. Uh, go get its text and stick it in a variable. All right, now I'm going to create a parser. This is where it gets a little deep. I need to. I'm going to hand you some XML. I got to be able to walk down that data, and walk all the way through the tree of data created by that XML, and that's going to be a dot called a parser. Okay, so I'm going to take my source here. That's the text content. And I'm going to turn it and hand it to the parser and have it create internally a tree. And we call that, we, the name of that tree is root. And it's the document 
in other words, the XML root document element. This is the outside tags right here, right? Now. This is it. This is my outside tags. Okay, now I'm going to make an output string. I'm going to start a table right here. I'm going to write some headings right here. Now, this is where this is where we get to what you're going to be able to do. Here are my loops. I'm going to make a table. Here's my open table. Here's my ending table. You've seen this before. I'm going to make rows. Two different types of rows in my table. We've done this. I'm going to roll this thing into a table. And the thing I'm going to put in the rows, I'm going to put the node name. Okay, let's read that. Node, node and tag are the same thing. So I'm calling three things now. Node tags and then elements. So what's the name of the tag? What kind of tag is it? And what is its text value? What's the value between the tags? I'm going to roll through all this. Come back and look at this it's a little bit differently. Stick it in the table. Let's watch this run. Let's watch what I make here. So here's my data. Here's my data. I'm going to roll this bay about. Boom. Okay, there's the node numbers, node names, context. Well, that looks pretty interesting, right? Not bad at all. If we go back over there and do that. Put the answer over here, right? Like that. Okay, so we can see that the first node is called family, and it has children. Family, and there's family. As a matter of fact, it looks like it has uh, four children. Right, one's a dad, Fred. One's a mom, Alice. One's a son, John. Or another son named Alfred, and a daughter named Mary. All right. John, Alfred, Mary. Now notice we don't have a DTD here, but we, it seemed to figure it out okay. So there's my outside Ted and I've got dads and moms and sons and daughters. Pretty simple. Rolls it right out, no problem. Okay, so this is how this is how I'm gonna get my hands on this data. Now I've got XML, let's go back up here and look at this. When when this thing gets loaded as a tree. A root now is a tree. Root is root is the outside set of tags, right? Here's my table, column headings. And notice what my loop is. My loop is root.childnodes.length. Right, so I can tell you I can tell you what the answer that we go back over here and look at this. It's probably zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's uh, 11. All right, so I'm only concerned, every node has a type. And I'm only concerned about type 1 nodes. These are, these are tags that have data in between them and no other tags. So I'm going to walk through all of, all of the nodes on the tree. And I'm going to ask the question, if the node type is 1, meaning it is a tag with data, what I want you to do is I want you to write out a new row. This writes out a new row. And you're going to write out the node number, how many, and the, the name of the tag, the type of node, and the text value of the node. And if it's the, if it's the root, if it's the root, the root's not going to have any text. This is, it's going to have children, but, but no text. So it'll be a little bit different. Someone asked the question, if, it's, if node type is equal to 1, right, or it's the first tag, you know, write this out. So different on the first node. And put it in the table, then slam it into a data island, and you get that. Okay, so what we've done is we've touched this thing. We have, uh, we've done a reasonably fair job of uh, touching, you know, every, everything involved in, in laying out that piece. Okay, so let's, let's quick summary here. The summary part is we've got the document object model, we've got a handle on that data, we're going to roll it through, and we're going to use these things, node name and primarily text context. Now the other thing I have to need to know is how many I've got, 
and that's always this magic number, root.childnodes.length. Okay, root means how many tags are underneath the root. Now that, that works over and over and over and over again. All right, that's, that's sort of the first version of this. First version of this is I'm going to be able to roll it out. Now notice I could have done a lot of things in here as I was rolling this out. So, well, you, you, you should feel pretty familiar with this part of this loop right here. I could have done anything in here. I could have translated these things. I could have underlined them. I could have turned them green if they were three. I, I, this is, this is very, just be very familiar to you. It's my table. I roll through all the elements in the table, put the table in a dev block. Nothing unusual about that. It's just where I'm getting my data. I'm getting it out of, I'm getting it out of this tree. Okay, but we're, we're, we're using really, really simple trees. All right, another thing I can do with the data is I can format it using cascading style sheets. Okay, this is where these two topics on the final exam overlap a little bit. Um, this, this is really, we're not going to really spend a lot of time on this because we're going to talk about CSS a lot. But you can use XML to tell the browser how you want the table, how the tags to look. So what I did here is I just made this CSS. This is, this is called a XML style sheet, right? Looks like this. It just says here all my tag name and what I, basically what color I want to make them. And that's pretty simple. Now save this. This all sits in a .css file. We'll get into this again when we talk about cascading style sheets later. But we just wanted to show that you could insert it in to an XML file. So here's my style sheet. Here's my XML and Here's all the data. So here's my style sheet. This is this file right here. Right? So what happens is, boom, I put, make it pretty colors. Right? Red's red. Right? Red's the dad. He's red. Oops. Mom's blue. Mom's are blue. Sons are brown. Daughters are green. Like that. Simple. Let's, let's don't worry too much about style for the moment. We just want to get the handle on the fact that what we've got here is we've got a tree. All right, this is going to be the biggest thing to get our head around is this concept of a tree. Okay, so we've looked at the XML DTD, how to specify how the tags are related to one another. This kind of business here. We've looked at how to see things about XML in the browser, how we can roll the data out and look at the data in XML in the browser, how we can change its style properties. Simple stuff. Now let's do something serious. Okay. Now we're, now we're getting in, into a little bit more interesting circumstances. So we're going to use this one. We're going to talk about cross-browsers issues. One, one, of the, one of the problems with XML is that the browsers don't necessarily treat this the same way. And specifically, the division is between the IE browser and all the other browsers. Now, technically, this, is, uh, this, this whole thing was invented by Microsoft. So it, it actually went into the original version of some of the IE browsers. So XML, the XML document object model is really an invention of Microsoft. Now, the other browser vendors just could not tolerate this, so they, they sort of decided they're going to do a couple of other things with it. But we'll get into this cross-compatibility issue as we go along, but let's sort of start off on the historical basis. So I got some interesting data here. This is the Marx Brothers. Uh, it is all of the movies that the Marx Brothers made. Y'all probably aren't know, old enough to know who the Marx Brothers are, but let's just suppose these these were movie stars in the 1930s. And what I'm doing is I'm making a file of the Marx Brothers movies. That's my outside set of tags. Now the, the content is there are a bunch of movies, and each movie has a title. The year the movie was made, and a bunch of roles. 
title is a number, year is a number. The role is the name of an actor and the character that actor played in the movie. Okay, so this is, this is sort of the cast, right? The name of the movie, what year it was, who played what part in the movie. And then I'm going to have multiple movies. Okay, so this is, this, I'm going to go look at a JavaScript function here to parse this using the Microsoft XML DOM, the document object model. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a situation where I'm going to start off with a string. I'm going to have to read my XML into my JavaScript function as a string. And in this case, this looks like I'm reading it out of a text box or a text area or something like that. So this is my XML. Now, I, I need to know Microsoft, I need to know whether this is IE or not because I'm going to have to do things different ways. So this little piece of code right here is a piece of code that tries to ascertain whether or not this is the IE browser. Okay, so, and it does a couple of things. It looks at the Navigator user agent, and this is Trident. Trident is what uh, <clears throat> Navigator thinks is IE. All right, so this, this is not really something that you would be interested in. It's just, just a way to go about ascertaining whether or not it's an IE browser. Okay, so if it's an IE browser... Right. I'm going to use the Microsoft Document Object Model. Now, notice what's going to happen if it's if it's if it's not true that it's zero. In other words, if it's not Microsoft, it's going to say I can't do I can't do this for you. Okay, but this is this is we're looking at the Microsoft case, the IE case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, uh, the, the object model for XML here, and I'm going to load the XML up in this variable named x. This is where I went down and got the data off the page. Now I come out here and I load it into XML. I set the root. I start my table. And I roll through root.childnodes.length. Now this is, so this is root, at how, which is how many movies? This is my movie loop. So here's a new row. I put Various things in various places. Let's go down and look at the answer here. Go down here. Let's look at the answer just so you can see what happens when I execute this piece of code. Boom. Okay, so here's here's the output from the IE DOM, Marx Brothers movies. First movie, 1929. Movie title, Coconuts. And these are the Marx Brothers: Zeppo, Groucho, Harpo, and Chico. And a regular actress named Margaret Dumont, who was in numerous of these movies. And these are the characters that they played. And then there was 1930, there's the movie Animal Crackers. Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. These are the brothers. And then there's Margaret Dumont again. She played in that movie. Monkey Business, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. No Margaret Dumont in that one. Horse Feathers, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. Duck Soup, Margaret Dumont, again, Night at the Agra, Margaret Dumont's there, Day at the Roses, Margaret's there, all the brothers, Margaret at the Circus, Margaret, who's missing? Chico's, oh, who's missing? Groucho, Chico, and Harpo. Hmm, and one of the brothers is missing there. So you can see this keeps going on down and boom, end of the line. Okay, well, let's, this is that piece of code. So we come up here and we can see here's my here is my child nodes, here's my movies loop. Remember it's a it's a plus in the movies, right? Table row. Now I've got these these child nodes here. All right. Here's the detection algorithm. Let's go a little, look a little bit about that. This is my detection algorithm. Uh, the DOM parser. Okay, so the second version of this program is going to use, if it's not IE, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to use some, we're not going to use up here, we used the 
Microsoft XML DOM. Only going to work in IE. And this one, we're going to use the DOM parser, which is going to work in all the other browsers, the non-IE browsers. Well, oh, by the way, it also works in IE. Okay, so, all right, so here's the second version of the truth. I'm, I'm going to lose my loops here. I go get, I go get the XML string off the page. Now, i got to do a couple of things here. i got to get rid of all the carriage returns, line feeds, and tabs. So this is my little routine to take out all of those because I can't have any of those in there. We'll talk, well, that'll come back and talk us later. Okay, we're going to have a new parser. I'm going to load it up. Here's the root. Here's the Marx Brothers movies, and this looks very, very similar to the one we did right up here. Well, sort of. Sort of. Let's go down and look at what the difference is here. So here's the difference between the, the Microsoft version and everybody else. Okay, so Microsoft, it, it doesn't care about, you know, if you put carriage returns at the end of a tag or have spaces between the tags. But the non-Microsoft thing does. You absolutely, it's, it'll, it'll blow up if you've got one blank space that's not encased inside tags. All right, so what we've got to go through, we've got to go through and we've got to check all that. All right, so the, the non-Microsoft version um, uses a property called text to get to the data. I'm sorry, Microsoft uses text. Everybody else uses child node zero dot node value. Wow. So notice this is a lot simpler than this. All right, so this, this is because of the way that XML is actually stored. Right? It, it actually takes, when you have a node, that, that's really an element, and, and then each element has one child which contains the value. So it, it separates the, the node itself and the value of the node. So it takes two nodes for every value. One to define the element and one to define the value. So Whereas we Microsoft just goes and gets text directly, this version you've got to go to its child and get the value, meaning from the element. Okay, so on the exam, I'm going to tell you, it'll be one of these two things. I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to work. Okay, so let's go, let's go, let's go finish this now. Uh, this is called a recursive parser. This is called TreeWalk. This is the third version. Here we'll look at the DOM and we'll notice that it got the same answer. This is a DOM parser versus this is IE. This is everybody else. Now notice this is IE and IE works on this one and IE works on that one. All other browsers will work here. Only IE will work here. And the difference again is this. In Microsoft you say this. In non-Microsoft you say that. To get to the value at the end of the node. Okay. Now this last version is, is a recursive version. We, we, don't, we just don't know some things, but we're going to look at this process. This is called TreeWalk. Now TreeWalk is a re recursive algorithm, and it's going to walk down all the trees. That's why it's called TreeWalk. So now we're going to go up the branches, Walk down all the branches, come back, I'm going to cover every end more ending branch in the whole tree. This is the algorithm for doing that. And the general idea is, as long as we have children, we keep looking at the children. Not a big deal, there's a big loop. And so the loop calls tree walk. This is the recursion. And if it's type 1 node, this is a tag, not the contents of the tag. Let's go on down, let's skip on down and look at this one. We've got to go to the DOM parser, go to this one, get the same answer. Okay, so we're not really going to use this third version. We're going to focus on the second version. 
this version and the IE version, which is this one, the one where we use dot text down here. We use dot child nodes zero dot node value. Okay, slightly different. So you can see here this one goes with that one and that one goes with that one. Okay, so we'll have two different ways. Now I'm going to be very specific about that. Let's go, let, let's just go real quick over and look at an exam so you can get a little bit of idea about how this is working. Let's go find, let's go find an exam. Okay, we go down to the midterm. That's the midterm down to the final. Let's take one of these, like fall. Okay, so you can see this is this is this is the the XML question. This is clearly the XML question. Okay, here's the, here's the DTD. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to roll it out in the table. You run it. You get this. Here's the answer. Now what you'll notice is it's there's a state loop, right? Looks like. And then there's towns within each state, right? Some states have a lot of towns, some states have very few towns. And here's what you need to know to write the code. Here these are all your loops and all the quantities you need to write that code. Here's the number of states. Here's the state loop. Here's the state name. Here's the towns loop. Okay, here's the state name. These are towns. Here's the town name, the reason name, the population. And notice these all end in child node zero dot node value. So we're going to use the non IE version here when we're actually trying to get values. Rolls out like that. Okay, so this this is the most important thing on the question is. It's I give you all the loops and I give you the names of all the things and all you got to do is construct this table. Easier said than done. But that's the idea. Okay. Let's run down here to the DOM parser. Yeah, so we'll have a whole session. We'll have a couple of sessions toward the... Um, gets closer to final time. We'll do nothing but go over these things. I, don't, I, want, I want to make a point that we're going to spend as much time on these lectures here talking about how to answer these questions as we are presenting new material. Okay, so we're skipping that third version. You can see here just give you an idea how long how much data this is. So this is the Marx Brothers XML here. It's quite long. Right? And here are the three very three various ways I can process this XML data and produce an HTML table. Okay, let's back out of this. All right. Now we're going to change topics here. Now we're going to talk, this, this is effective. We're talking about Ajax here again. Ajax, this is, uh, let's go back over to the syllabus here. Down to... Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Okay, A J A X. All right, back over here. All right, so this is what this is what Microsoft invented. Now you don't you don't ever see this. This is this is all background. But normally, what happens when you go to a web page and you want to go to another web page, you have a link, or you can go up and type something in the address bar, change pages, or whatever. Okay, so what Ajax does is Ajax allows the browser in the background to go out and load other web pages into your browser. It takes six lines of code to do that. Now, it can do this without you knowing that it has been done. And it uses what is called XML HTTP. 
now commonly referred to as Ajax. Notice this is 20 years old. And I haven't changed this at all because it still works. All right, so this is this is Microsoft XML HTTP. Okay, so what I'm going to do with this this is Java. This is, think of this as JavaScript running. I'm going to create this Microsoft object here, and I'm going to send a request to some web page somewhere, and I'm going to tell it to send me back some XML. I'm going to send the XML. Send. And that web page is going to send me something back. That's the idea. So the, the idea is asynchronously. In other words, while you're no matter what you're doing on the page, up in the JavaScript, I send a request to a different web page, do something, and come back. And it doesn't sound important. Well, but actually, it's critically important. Okay, so here's a little accounting example of that fact. This is this is an Ajax account lookup with XML on the count XML HTTP. I uh, know this is only 15, 16 years old. Okay, so what I have is I have, I have an, a, an accounting ledger out there, and I don't remember the account number, but I know it's got the uh, the account numbers four parts: major, minor, sub one, sub two, and there's an account description. Okay, so I'm sitting here on the browser, and I want you to go look up when I press the 1 here. When my finger came up off that key, I sent a request via HMX, XML HTTP to the server to bring me back. Every account number had a 1 at the beginning of the major. Wow, we had 18 records. Now, if I say, send me all the records, I'm going to type a zero here, a zero, and notice what happens is that goes out and brings me back all the records that have, as the major, first two characters are one zero. Notice now I'm down to four, right? You know, one right here. Boom. Okay, this is called Ajax. Every time my finger comes off this keyboard, I'm going out to the server getting some data, coming back, and refreshing this screen. Now, this, this is happening tremendously fast. Three. Notice type of three, everything that begins with three. Whoops. Let me do minor. Minor begins with a two. Minor begins with a five. Minor begins with a 9, sub 2 begins with a 9, none. There's only one. Find me an account description with the word cash net. Oops. Counts payable. It lets me look up things. Uh, now you don't you don't know how many times a day you do this, but this 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 is called or it, it's it's actually Microsoft XML HTTP. Its name got changed to Ajax. And it got popular, popularized by Google. Okay, because Google used it to do what is commonly referred to as Google Suggest. So when I start typing in Google, G. Now what it's, what it did is it took that G. It went over to the server and it brought me back the top seven searches in Google that began with a G. C H A E L. Uh, these are the top seven things that have Michael in it on the web. Now I notice I'm not on that little list of top five, but so if 
I'm doing if I'm doing something particular. G E O R G. George Washington, Georgia, George Clooney, George Strait, George Bush Airport, George Michael. G E, I get German. I notice it's only the top seven. And it's happening every time I keep my my finger comes up off the keyboard. So and if I type nonsense. So it's, it's going out to the server and it's looking up. Well, I'm not sure what's happening on the server side, but I do know what's happening on this side is every time my finger comes up at the keyboard, the, this, this piece of code is sending a request to Google to bring me back the top seven things based on what I have typed in so far. And every time I, my finger comes up off the keyboard, it's doing that. This, this, is, this is not unusual at all. Okay. So this is, this is officially called XML HTTP, commonly called AJAX. Okay. Back over here like this. Okay, now let's look at some other applications. RSS. Uh, this is another thing you do. You probably do more of this than anything. This is, this is also all XML. Okay, so what you'll notice here, this, this is XML. This is the DTD for RSS. All right, really simple syndication. Really simple syndication. Now, this, this was originally sort of thought up as a way to send a whole bunch of data in a format that was commonly used. And what you see now is any anybody involved in a blog or any any time you're in a chat room or we're, we're moving small pieces of data back and forth it's highly likely how we're going to encapsulate that data and move it around is with rss really simple syndication what it means is we're going to we're going to move all the data inside of xml tags then we're going to take that xml file and we're going to ship that xml file back and forth now, the things that we're really interested in is that this tag right here, this is my outside set of tags, this is my channel. And each channel has multiple items. And here's the important one, each item. It has a title, some text, and a link. A whole bunch of these. A channel has a whole bunch of items. Wow. Sound familiar? I mean, it's just, this is text. You're just looking at this just like it's XML because it is XML. Now, there are a huge number of optional. These are all optional things. These are all optional things because they're separated by these pipes here. But title, link, and description for the channel is required. Title and description. And then there, there's, look at look, these, these things are huge. Other things you might include in here. Most people don't, but you might. Uh, we, there might you might have an image, got a URL. You might have a language piece in. You might have a publication date, source URL, copyright date. Uh, a couple of things. But here's way one. Here's one filled out. Okay, so here's some channel with some data in it. So it's, it's XML on the outside. It's version 2 of RSS. Here's my channel tag. There. Notice my channel tags inside of RSS tags. Here's my title. Here's the link that will appear. And here's the content. English. Here's, the, here's an image. Image has a title. Here's the URL of the image. And here's the link that goes with it. So I can make the link hot. If I leave out this, it's just a link. Right. If I put these two things in, we're, we're going to be able to click on it. And notice it just the items, just one item after another after another inside a channel. Okay, it's a block. Right. So in general, what we get is we get this. We get a channel, title, link, description. 
item title link description item title link description boom like this okay this is this is like a blog of mine right so I got this here's my title here's my description notice I had it put the time and date on it like that could have put images in here like that Now this this was this is being handled by XSL. This this is the XSL. This is the the cascading style sheets, which you know are going to make absolutely no sense to you at this point in time, but it will after we get through with the second topic before the midterm, which is this. But the idea is we need to format this. So every time you see something like a blog or something like that, where where people are sending things in it they may have their picture and it's got a title and a date and there's some content that they're sharing with everybody uh, this is the format that it's all moved around so, so anytime you're involved in most things like chat or stuff like that you, what you're doing is you're going to have to ship the data around in xml you don't ever see, you see it all what you do what you see here is the processed part of what's been done with the xml Okay, so this whole page, this this is this is just to give you an idea of how prevalent the use of XML is on the internet and how long it's been around. Well, this is nothing new, but it's it's very background oriented. It's just, we're going to move data around to your browser, you know, and we need a format to move the data around. And XML is the most flexible of all the formats that you can have, which is why we're doing this. Okay, so this is RSS2. Notice that these these are the standards guy. The this is odd since since 2003. It's been it's been run out of kept out of Harvard Law School's computer. I'm not really sure why that's true, but that's where the actual revision history is. Let's see how the revision history is doing it. Revision history is probably pretty small. Yeah, done this in a while. <clears throat> these are some examples. Uh, and here's one that, that will be important to you. This is XBRL. Okay, XB, XBRL, this is Extensible Business Reporting Language. Read that. This is XML. And what we're going to put in XML is we're going to put financial statements. So this is used, XBRL is used by every company in the United States who is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Security, the Security and Exchange Commission requires publicly traded companies to report their earnings every three months. So how the companies get the data to the Securities and Exchange Commission is to encapsulate their accounting data, in particular the balance sheet and the income statement, into something that looks like XML. Uh, this has been going along for years. It, it, it has been around. I started doing this in what year here? 2008. Uh, it's XML. I mean, they say it's XBRL. And the only difference, the reason it's not an ML is because this language lets you, because it's actually sending rows and columns of accounting data, it lets you add up rows and columns. So it'll do a little fundamental arithmetic, but between the tags so here is this is uh, notice it's XML here's XBRL he's right here are all the references these are the schema references um, taxonomy assets total XML language for English XML language for German I assume that's, uh, I don't know what that is, Polish? Could be. Okay. XML. XML. And anytime, anytime you see these sort of obtuse tags where you don't really understand all the stuff, it's XML. It ain't, it ain't that difficult. There, there are a lot of standard versions of things that use XML and call it something else because they don't like the word XML. XML is just too general a word, but 
Notice in, in terms of this XBRL, which is purely defined for accounting financial data, uh, it, it has a lot of variations, and it's been around for a while. Okay. Here's Edgar. Here's the place they send the XML with all the financial data into it. And then we got assignment number three, and this is some stuff you need to look at in terms of assignment number three. It has an XML component, and that looks like that's it. All right, so we got started here, so let's review real quickly. We went over the DTD, how, how XML is laid out, what the DTD means. It lets us define the structure of the data, and, and we, can do, we can put virtually anything in XML. How we send it from the client, this is, this is AJAX. We can certainly do all of that. Typing example of AJAX. Really simple syndication is really XML. Okay, so these three things, like this. These three days I've just covered. So I want to put this video over here, this uh, video link over here, and we'll do a couple of other things. So I think I'll sign off. Y'all can email me if you got any questions. I think we're going to say we're done.